Hello, and welcome to the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. I'm your host, Benjamin Douglas, and this is the show where each week I read a chapter from a different indie author. Thanks for joining me for today's reading. Hello, everybody, readers and writers alike. Thanks for joining me, your host, Benjamin Douglas, for another episode today of the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. Today is episode number 44. We are coming up on the big 5-0. I don't know if you're excited. I'm getting excited. <laughs> I hope I excite you. I'm exciting myself here. I don't want to be excited all alone. That's no fun. Um, don't know yet quite what I'm going to do to celebrate 50 and then a year's worth of episodes, but it's coming up on the radar. And hey, if you have any ideas, feel free to drop them in the comments at http colon slash slash the book speaks podcast dot wordpress dot com or uh, find me on Twitter. I'm at cantankerous Ben. I'm always up for speaking to uh, readers, writers, listeners to the show. Anybody. <laughs> I'm a friendly guy. Today, I'm going to be reading a chapter from Synergy of Hopes, a science fiction space opera novel by indie author Edwin Downward. And I'm going to begin, as I always do, by reading his Amazon author bio. Edwin Downward describes himself as a Christian, a father, a husband, and a writer of science fiction adventures. The Downward family lives as far away from his work, near the center of Vancouver, British Columbia, as a reasonable commute will allow, in a small house guarded by a crack squad of vorpal bunnies surrounded by a duo, supported by a duo of karate kitties. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> Good, and that's his the very delightful blurb. My bad. I, it'd be difficult to be surrounded by two... Uh, kitties, but I guess kitties, you know, maybe they curl around you, so maybe. Good. Uh, nice to meet you uh, uh, digitally, Edwin. That is also how I would describe myself, except I don't live in British Columbia and I don't have um, any bunnies, <laughs> but good for you. Um, so Edwin actually found me. He's been listening to the show. Hi, Edwin. <laughs> And uh, I was very happy to read a chapter from his book, Synergy of Hopes. This is book one of his Worlds Together series. Um, I, think, I think the audience of the show will enjoy it because I've read so much science fiction. And it's funny, I did not set out <laughs> with this being a genre-specific show. In fact, I've made a, a, a concerted effort at times to read genres I wouldn't even read uh, on my own, some romance and some um, uh, romantic comedy even. Um, but there's just been a lot of sci-fi because as I mentioned in the beginning of the show, sci-fi is kind of having a big moment right now. And I'm not going to lie, I'm enjoying reading a lot of science fiction right now. So speaking of which, I can't recall if I've plugged this recently on the show or not, but I just finished reading Tech Mage by Chris Fox. And woof! I gotta tell you guys, so <laughs> let me explain something. I've read some of Chris Fox's fiction in the past, and I enjoyed it, but I mostly read it because I admire Chris Fox so much as a figurehead in the indie author community, and I want to support him uh, and kind of see what he's doing. Um, but this book, Tech Mage, from his Magitech Chronicles, the first book, this book really stands on its own. I don't care who wrote this thing. This book is good. I got, you know, like just a few pages in and I was hooked. I was like, yes, this is what I've been waiting for. This is Chris Fox coming into his own. And I think he knows that because he's talked about how it's sort of an entree into a world that he's been developing for years. I don't know, decades. I'm not sure, Chris, maybe you can correct me if you ever hear this. Um, <laughs> but he's talked on a couple of podcasts about how this is this is an, a, an entry point into a, a world, a universe that he's had in mind for a long time. Um, so he's had time to work out all the details and the magic system and the world building. And it's really seamless. It's well written. The characters and the plotting are all great because he's had lots of practice with that by now. And uh, if you haven't checked it out yet, I really cannot recommend this highly enough. I'm talking about mm, uh, Tech Mage, book one of Chris Fox's Magitech Chronicles. 
But there's my commercial for the day, unsponsored, by the way. Chris, if you want to throw me a few dollars, I won't stop you. Um, back to Edwin Downward and Synergy of Hopes. I'm going to go ahead now and read the uh, book blurb that is the Amazon book description for Synergy of Hopes. They have nothing in common but a will to survive. Far beyond the edge of charted space, in his grandfather's crippled ship, Ensign Nivpool Exivant knows he cannot get home without help. A derelict ship tumbling on the edge of a stellar storm offers a slim chance to learn more about where he is and what nearby resources may be available to start him on his way. The ship is not so derelict. But how far can he trust the sole occupant he rescues from certain death? And how long will it be before their divergent needs forces them to part? If only the disaster spawned vision that haunts his dreams didn't suggest otherwise. Read Synergy of Hopes, Edwin Downward's debut science fiction adventure novel. Awesome. Sick. Good. So um, there is the uh, book blurb for Synergy of Hopes. It's a really fun cover. I like these covers um, that are showing up in sci-fi now that don't just have a spaceship, but also have a couple of models, like a couple of human faces. Um, I'm sort of wondering if that's going to be a trend uh, since the spaceship and the spaceship battle has sort of been done to death over the last couple of years. I don't know, um, but I feel like I'm seeing a few of them around. So good on you, uh, Edwin. I'm also seeing the book uh, placed in and ranking in space opera. And I'm kind of, you know, I've got a question for listeners about this. I would love to hear some of you who are science fiction readers and or writers uh, hit me back and comment about what is it that constitutes space opera as opposed to military science fiction as opposed to action adventure science fiction. I'm really curious about those three in specific. Now there are some more subsets that are closely related like um, space marines, space fleet, uh, interstellar travel, first contact, artificial intelligence. I feel like more of those are self-explanatory <laughs> because the primary trope is the genre title the niche title, the subgenre title. But these other subgenres, especially, I have a really hard time with space opera. Like, I, I feel like I know what it is by context until you tell me a certain book is or is not space opera. And then I kind of scratch my head and I say, well, why or why not? And here's why it's a personal, uh, a question of personal interest for me. I put out my Starship Fairfax books, which I'm sort of in the process of rewriting now. <laughs> they were first drafts, <laughs> but I put them out and they, they did okay. And, um, and I called them um, military science fiction because that's what was hot at the moment. But they're really more like action adventure science fiction, if I'm being honest. But then I started getting reviews, good reviews, four and five star reviews saying, these are a great short series of space operas. And I kind of, I said, what? <laughs> these, these aren't space operas. They're all within our solar system and there are no alien species and there's no huge fleet war. I don't understand how this is space opera. So, um, wow. But you know what? The reader said it's space opera. So here's what I did before my big promo push on book one. I put it in space opera and you know what? I got to number one of the free space opera chart when it was free for five days for my Kindle countdown or my, my Kindle unlimited free days. I kid you not. And I got so many downloads and I got a good amount of read through in the series, especially in Kindle unlimited after that big free push number one in space opera. I would never have called the book space opera if someone else hadn't validated that by stepping in first and saying, I really like this book and it's a space opera. So I'm asking you all, and Edwin, feel free to chime in too, since you've got a space opera book here. What, wh what the heck is a space opera? <laughs> I thought I knew because I like Star Wars, but apparently I have no idea. So I'm, I'm real curious. 
Good. Um, in the reading you're about to hear today, this, by the way, is the entire first chapter. Um, you're going to be introduced to what I presume is the main character. You're going to see some of his characteristics and traits, uh, some of his motivations, and then you're going to get this really cool launch sequence, which I really admire, Edwin, because I am not a technical writer this way when it comes to science fiction. I have like no hard science, and I know this isn't technically hard science because it's pretty fiction-y. I mean, we're talking about interstellar travel. <laughs> and yet it's sort of written in a hard science style. Um, it's very matter of fact about what the main character is doing in the ship to initiate the launch sequence. I think that's super cool. Uh, Edwin says he has a bargain booksy promo on this title coming up on February 2nd here in 2018. That's six days from today. Uh, so if you enjoy what you hear and or you're a fan already and you want to support Edwin, uh, you might consider picking up this title in about a week. I'm sure that'll help with his promo effort. And he also is telling me that he's pushing hard to have the sequel Into the Crucible in the wild by mid-May. So uh, by mid-May, there should be book two in this series out as well. I hope you enjoy this reading today. I want to remind everybody first, as always, this reading does not come from an official audiobook. It is presented here just for the purpose of this podcast and with the author's permission. Thanks again to Edwin for being so gracious and letting me read from his work today. I hope you all enjoy it. This is the first chapter from Edwin Downward's Synergy of Hopes. Do come back next week for another indie author reading. Synergy of Hopes Worlds Together Book One by Edwin Downward Chapter One The morning crush on the promenade forced Ensign Nivpool Exavent to slow his pace. He'd forgotten today's mall-wide sail when choosing this route over the service corridors. Once the center of a cargo space able to handle heavy transports to abreast, the makeover had made this module too popular for its own good. A tight knot of milling shoppers forced him closer to the busy storefronts on his right. The urgent summons to his grandfather Raji's office hadn't given him much time to consider what it could all be about. That his mother would give him a surprise just thinking of you call shortly after only made him that much later. She explained that his dad had already left the house for an early meeting at station admin. The mouth-watering aroma of pastries wafted from the bakery, only to be replaced by the salty planet-side simulation scents from the aromatherapy boutique two doors further down. Up ahead, the banner above Outcast's Clothiers, white leathering on deep green, read, Best Deals on Motherlode, clothing almost too good for life on a deep space station. Niv had to chuckle. Pernum never missed a chance to poke fun at his old life of, as he would say so often, dressing up the imperial court. Did you hear? Niv saw Jeeve Coutier among a group of this year's Academy seniors gathered at the entrance of Crobb's Café. Rumor has it, Noble House Argodir just lost a destroyer to the raiders. A destroyer? You expect us to believe mere raiders have what it takes to trash a destroyer? Niv didn't recognize the charming brunette. The best path through the throng took Niv closer. Why not? Another senior said. These raiders have already proven themselves tougher than anyone in recent memory. Do you think it's true, then? Another member of the group leaned in. What they say about these raiders being scouts for a new power, one previously uncharted by the Nine Kingdoms? Jeeve glanced Niv's way. Hold on. 
Ensign! Ensign Exivant! The shock of being acknowledged by a member of this group caused Niv to falter. Jeeve motioned for him to come closer. Ensign, you've spent more time in the operations zone than all of us combined. What do you think? I bet I know more than Red does. Niv spun to find his arch nemesis, Ensign Corin Van Cord, almost on top of him. And what would you know? The brunette folded her arms. When am I due to ship out on Marhale? In about two days, Jeeves said. Wrong. We detach in an hour. I'm on my way there now. He looked down his nose at Niv as he brushed past. They've accelerated their plan to expand the picket line? I didn't think much of it. The name Hingus came to Niv's mind when he looked at the speaker. But this morning, my sister, the one posted aboard the tug Seensaw, told me their trip to Azkiel had been put off. Azkiel is towards the Argodir frontier, the brunette said. But it's just as likely the Hull Workers Guild has raised yet another grievance to a used module being sold to the League of Freemen. Assuming the Duke's officials haven't intervened yet again, of course. A number of the cadets voiced their agreement. She looked about the group, then gave Niv a head-to-toe glance. Well, 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 Van Cord said. Looks like our very own lovely Borali would like a proper introduction to Red. The tiniest of gasps escaped Borali's lips, and a hint of red touched her face as she turned away. Jeeve and a second cadet traded intent glances before closing ranks between her and Vancord. Almost as fast, another brunette closed on Niv. I think you'd better move on. Niv didn't need a second prompt. He headed off. Not ten paces later, an elderly lady stepped into his path. You should be ashamed of yourself, exciting a young lady like that. She continued on her way before he could formulate an answer. Never mind, Mrs. Fuglecar. A gentleman put his hand on Niv's shoulder. She didn't see the whole thing. I did. You have nothing to worry yourself about. He too moved on. Niv stood frozen on the spot as he sought to make sense of everything. He'd never even got the chance to speak up before Vancord scuttled any possibility of making a good impression. He stifled a desire to glance back in search of Borali. Still, he couldn't fault them for pushing him away, or Mrs. Fuglecar for acting on what she had witnessed. A hurried passerby jostled him into remembering where he needed to be. Niv touched the announcer panel and said, Grandfather Raji, it's Nivpool. The door opened to reveal a moderate-sized office made to look smaller by the presence of two large desks and shelving on every wall. Hundreds of pieces of memorabilia filled every horizontal space not needed for actual work. A fist-sized silver-blue globe embossed with the words, Raji Exivant, Scripture Memorization, most verses this term, held a place of prominence to his left. At the far end of the room sat the cherished scale model of the merchantman Loabakel, lost so many years ago. Below this, in the place of highest honor, sat the last recorded image of his grandmother, chiseled nose, deep-set eyes, 
olive cheeks, touches of white offsetting her black hair. Niv had heard the story behind every item in this room at least once, and these three more than half the others combined. The clink of porcelain against porcelain caught his attention. I've just finished steeping a hot brew. Would you like a cup? Yes, Grandfather. Thank you. Once again, he hoped he'd be as spry in his eighty-fifth year. And a touch of milk, just as you like it. Grandfather Raji handed him a steaming cup on its saucer. Niv met his grandfather's gaze by looking a little lower than had once been necessary. Those gray eyes, a shade lighter than his own, didn't waver, now or ever. They also shared the same chiseled nose, olive skin, and oblong face. The greatest difference between them lay in the contrast between the brown hair of his grandfather's youth and his own flaming red fuzz. Did something happen on the way here this morning? He could never keep a secret from his grandfather. There was an incident on the promenade. A group of senior cadets asked my advice on something. Well, this lady, Barali, she was looking at me when Ensign Vancord made a suggestive remark about the two of us. I see. And what do you think of Miss Borali? He sighed. What does it matter now? Grandfather Raji paced to the far side of the room, then turned around. Your father's right. I have indulged you too much. Indulged me? How? His grandfather picked up the Zhang Qi trophy Niv had won at age twelve. The bronzed elephant sparkled in the full spectrum light from the overhead illumination. You were always so much like me, shy, alone, yet when you put your mind to something you excelled. He set the trophy down. I gave you too many excuses and not enough encouragement when it came to spreading your social wings. I don't understand. And that's the point. He closed the gap between them. Take this thing with Miss Borali. Because Vancord saw another opportunity to take a stab at you, and there are things you should have learnt about that too, you think that door is closed. He fixed Niv with his gaze. That may even be true, but you'll never know if you don't try. Before Niv could get past the impulse to deny, his grandfather picked up his grandmother's picture. I almost lost my sweet Silsnia the same way, but oh, the joy I knew the day her smile led me to ask for the privilege of courting her affection. Niv knew that tone of voice, where this would go, and not to interrupt until his grandfather was ready. One day he'd meet the right girl and likewise court her affection. That which we call interstellar dynamics can be as fickle as any romance. Niv couldn't believe his ears. His grandfather rarely strayed in the telling of this story. Oh, how I pity those societies that remain system-bound, that have never reached beyond the dampening effect of their star's gravity well. His grandfather had skipped the intro and exchanged the picture for a model of one of the oldest known interstellar vessels. But others remembered. They knew how to interact at the interstellar level. Oh, mass was always an issue. The bigger the ship, the more it took to move it, but they could lay in a direction, a speed, and a distance to traverse the stars via such fixed flights. Niv hoped to put his grandfather back on track, 
by handing him the next model in this story. That's right. The day came when we began to understand. We still had to fix direction and speed, but we could open up the flight by gaining control over where to engage the mast generator and when to stop. His grandfather put the model in the middle of the desk and went back for the Loa Bakel. But for all we thought we understood, we remained powerless when the forces inherent within interstellar dynamics are revealed in the fullness of fury. I lost them all to that one storm. Your grandmother, your aunts, your uncles. Once again, he fixed Niv with his gaze. You would not be here today if your grandmother had not insisted it was time to have the talk with your father. Such a blunt and personal deviation from the story left him speechless. The elder Exavant sipped his brew and said, Forgive me. It's been a hectic morning, and I did tell you I had something special in store. O oh Lord, this blessing we pray in your most holy name, Grandfather Raji said. Amen, Niv said before opening his eyes. The assembly deck loomed large before him. Overhead catwalks with their heavy lifting cranes sat silent. Storage and workshop hatches remained shut. The hull of the most remarkable ship ever built caught the muted lighting, making the space seem even darker. Christened Conhor, though still lacking its official emblazons, Niv could never look upon this ship without his breath catching. This is where he had spent so many of his formative years in and out of the academy, with his grandfather's life's work. Some even said only his grandfather knew more about this vessel than he did. Conhor had the sleek shape of a delta wing atmospheric craft, except these wings continued to thicken until they created a ripple-free seam with the main body, as seen from the rear. The wings began further aft than on other ships of this general design, and spread wider to the tips. When asked why he designed this ship to stand out so much, his grandfather would only say, Trust me. The ship rested on a trio of squat landing struts. On the port side of the nose, beginning where the wing merged into the forward section and reaching forward, the gangway stood open, an airlock ramp that would lift and fold into a seamless seal when it came time to launch. Beyond, Tight but comfortable living quarters for five occupied less than a quarter of the ship's volume. To help justify the cost of building a ship capable of testing the revolutionary MOST generator within, his grandfather had agreed to incorporate other developments slated for general production in the near future. The pair of drives that gave Conhor the ability to travel at megameters per second could generate 20% more power for their size, without any loss in maneuverability. The hull contained 15% more defensive nodes, each capable of reacting 9% faster than any deployed to date. More obvious to the casual observer, improved shock absorption techniques allowed each wing to take two missile launchers, each able to hold six missiles. Standard power management systems had always limited a ship of this size to a maximum of nine MAST enhanced lasers, one heavy and two lights on each wingtip and the nose. 
Such an observer would note the second nose mounted heavy, but would never guess that these weapons also packed a bigger punch and cycled faster than their contemporaries. Continued silence caused Niv to look around. Grandfather, where is everyone? Waiting for you to suit up. Suit up? You don't think I'd let my favorite grandson pilot the most coveted flight he's ever looked forward to without requiring every conceivable precaution to be taken? His grandfather would never joke about something like that, would he? Independent confirmation came in just two hours ago. The storm tracking between us and the nearest Argodir listening posts has rendered them blind in the near term. This didn't sound like a joke. What about my crew? There isn't one. It had to be. But the council spoke, forbade a solo first flight. Grandfather Raji placed a hand on his shoulder, and I convinced them to reconsider that ruling. The scene saw is standing by to tow you to the test zone, where Marhael will be in position to observe. He gave Niv a light shove towards the locker area. Don't keep us waiting. Niv stumbled forward, making it halfway across the hangar before it hit him. The punchline had to be waiting for him on the other side of the hatch. He slowed and did his best to appear calm as he tapped the open switch. That ventilating fan they had yet to replace hissed. The faint odor of suit disinfectant wafted from the room. Half-energy lighting created shadows too nebulous for anyone to hide in. His suit hung ready on the outside of his locker. His hand trembled as he reached out to touch it. Could this be the real thing? Him, solo, at the helm of his dream flight? Niv configured Conhor's main monitor to supply an enhanced color display of the mast field surrounding them, and focused the view on Seensaw's underside. The shimmering energy dance of deceleration back to the world of MEPS had already begun. His stomach threatened to join in. Measured breaths helped him to maintain something of the composure he'd attained during the flight out. He could almost envy the techs aboard Marhale, with their scientific distance and their front row seat to Conhor's entrance into the history books. He glanced at the empty co-pilot's seat and shivered. His entrance into the history books. The spectacle outside had begun to fade when the screen refreshed to a link with the tug's captain. Conhor, you are free to proceed. Good luck and Godspeed. Niv heard a quiver in his voice when he said, Thank you, sir. The captain gave him a questioning look, one that conveyed doubt about his ability before closing the channel. The screen went back to a view of the tug, now moving off. Niv took a deep breath and willed himself to relax in the knowledge these preliminaries would be over soon. The rightmost of his six sub-monitors snapped on. Professor Quigley's radiation-scarred face filled the screen from his station aboard Marhale. Control to Conhor. Initiate Marhale data link and begin pre-flight checklist. Niv stiffened to attention. Command received. Initiating data link and pre-flight. Three of his sub-monitors flickered as the data link came online 
while the remaining two flashed through the checklist. From helmet and gloves being properly stored under the panel on his left, to the establishment of precautionary battle seals throughout the ship, all checks came back green. He'd never been more ready. The professor nodded. You are free to initiate stage one. Niv's hand hovered over the control panel. Beginning baseline fixed flight now. With the flick of a finger, he took Conhor to mast. The slightest of tremors came from the deck plates beneath his feet. He found himself holding his breath as Conhor accelerated to interstellar speeds for the first time. Updated displays relayed near textbook examples of how a mast generator should operate in this mode, and smoother than anything he'd ever experienced on other ships. At its core, the interlink channeled the power flow as the exert converter regulated the flux with a level of efficiency few other configurations could match. Marhale's long barrel form first appeared as a dot on the main viewer. In an instant, it had grown to the point he could make out details on the main screen, as the observer ship swung about to keep its primary sensors on him. A swift-to-aft view showed the picket ship disappearing as fast as it had appeared. Flight end decelerated Conhor back to MEPS. Conhor to control, coming about and awaiting your orders. He took his ship into a lazy 180. Everything looked good. They'd never call for a delay now. Professor Quigley said, Conhor, you are free to mast. Stand by to initiate stage two. On my mark. He tightened the turn to put Conhor on course. Any other ship would have required a maintenance cycle to the generator before he could act. A touch returned him to mast. Stage two now. This is for you, Grandfather. He tapped the board, and for the first time in recorded history, the mast generator began a controlled alteration of its field. The star field on his viewer fell off the right side of screen as Conhor went into a roll. Grandfather, it's everything we ever dreamt, and more. Easy, Ensign. Professor Quigley's voice cut through his reverie. Initiate evasive pattern gargoyle. Properly chastised, he turned his attention back to the task at hand. The pilot enhancement monitors read his slightest move, and Conhor began a new kind of dance one guaranteed to tax even Marhale's ability to track. Conhor, you're clear for stage three. Acknowledged. He placed Marhale in the center of the screen and took Conhor out of mast in a mock combat run. Marhale shared the same basic hull as a standard patrol cruiser, the thought of what the improved weapon systems could do to such a ship under these circumstances made him smile. The two ships passed close enough to set off proximity alerts before he took Conhor back to mast once more. This concludes another episode of the Book Speaks podcast, where the book speaks for itself. Thanks for joining me, your host, Benjamin Douglas, for another indie author reading. If you liked what you heard, be sure to visit http colon slash slash thebookspeakspodcast.wordpress.com for more episodes and for links to the author's website 
and the author's Amazon author page in the show notes. If you'd like to follow me on my own author journey, you can find me at http colon slash slash Benjamin Douglas Books dot wordpress dot com. And of course, if you're an indie author interested in having your work featured on the show, or if you're interested in discussing having your book read and produced by me as an audiobook, feel free to contact me at Benjamin Douglas Books at gmail dot com. Thanks for joining me today. I hope you have a productive and enjoyable weekend.